Um, I welcome members to the 32nd meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and ask members to switch off their mobile phones, which I am going to do as well myself. I do apologise. When it's decided to behave, I'll oh, stop it. It's all right, I am there. Thank you. It's proposed that the committee takes agendas, items, uh, numbers 10 and 11 in private. Item 10 will enable the committee to consider a draft report on the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Remedial Order 2015 SSI 2015-330. Uh, in private and item 11 will enable the committee to consider the evidence that's heard on the burial and cremation of Scotland bill. Are we content to take an, items 10 and 11 in private please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 2, the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill. Our next item is oral evidence on the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill. And I welcome from the Scottish Government and the Accountant in Bankruptcy, Richard Dennis, who's the Chief Executive Officer and the Accountant in Bankruptcy, Alex Reid, Head of Policy Development at the Accountant in Bankruptcy, and Graham Fisher, who's Head of Branch 1, Civil and Constitutional Law Division, Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Good morning, gentlemen. It's good to see you again. Uh, and I invite uh, members to questions and actually I'm starting. Gentlemen, the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill will consolidate legislation dating back over the past 30 years. Given that most of that legislation is in fact fairly recent, why is there a need for some consolidation, please? Um, well, um, I, 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 mean, I, I don't think the age of the legislation is necessarily a question when it comes to the value of consolidation. Uh, the value of consolidation is how many reforms and changes have been made to the initial legislation, how easy is it actually to use. In fact, um, you know, given that we've just actually completed um, what might be the most radical reforms to personal insolvency this century, now is a particularly good time for consolidation. If we consolidate now, um, the bill, the ease of use, the modernisation will be available for ongoing years. So actually, I mean, I think just after a period of major reform is a good time to consolidate rather than necessarily a bad time. Thank you. Can you provide any examples of the practical difficulties associated with using the current legislation? Um, possibly. I'm uniquely qualified to uh, give you some examples of the practical difficulties. Um, members of the committee might remember I was appointed to the Accountant in Bankruptcy um, in April, uh, coming to Lee to use the new legislation um, in its current state is very difficult to follow. Um, if you're talking about, um, in fact, I already use the draft of the consolidation bill rather than the existing legislation when I need to look up queries in, in, in the bill. Um, I mean, I think consolidation as a whole is about making legislation uh, simple, modern, up-to-date, dealing with inaccuracies, making sure it's easy to use, not only for the specialists, but also for people um, more generally. Um, it is extremely difficult to use the existing legislation I mean, I think there's some very detailed material set out in the background paper in paragraph six and seven about the overall approach to consolidation and why it's valuable. Um, that certainly applies um, uh, with, uh, you know, um, particular import, given how many times we've changed the 1985 Act. And if you were trying to read it and follow through uh, legislative requirements uh, for how it might affect you at the moment, I think you would struggle. Uh, you would need lots of different documents on the table in front of you, unless you were being able to pay for one of these uh, electronic consolidated versions, which uh, some of the professionals have access to. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dennis, you said we've just undertaken a major reform of the law in this area, and that's self-evidently so. I wonder at what point in the cycle we discover there is a need to tweak legislation. And I just put it to you that perhaps the time where the need to tweak legislation becomes most evident is when, as one implements immediately after a major reform, where, as people engage with the changes, they realise there are changes. And therefore, one might conclude, if that statement is, across the broad experience, correct, as to whether there is not therefore a case for waiting to see what further requirements there are following major reform for further change before doing consolidation? Um, I, I'll ask my colleagues to come in in a moment, moment on that. And my per particular perception is that, yeah, we did an awful lot of uh, very radical things in the Badass Act. 
um, we will want to see what the impact of compulsory financial education for certain classes of debtors is. Um, I think there was a members' debate on the use of the moratorium, which we also introduced um, around a fortnight ago. Um, the minimal asset process is new and fundamentally different. The work of the common financial tool is also um, you know, a significant change. And yes, we will want to see how these changes are bedded in and whether they deliver um, what the Parliament was hoping they would deliver. Um, I would also say, if you go out to the wider stakeholder community, um, they are very keen for us to stop changing things for a while. Um, you know, after a period of major reform, and, and the committee will know there have been four or five major bankruptcy acts in the last decade, um, the, the stakeholder community out there needs time to adjust to all the things we've been done. So I think it's highly likely that even if um, a tweak to bankruptcy legislation does become um, desirable, uh, there are good reasons for thinking we'll leave it a few years before we actually do it, uh, not least the question of parliamentary time. But I, I don't know if colleagues want to add. I suppose I would just maybe mention that, that you know, that obviously we had a Scottish Law Commission report in 2013 and then the series of changes in the 2014 Act. And there's one issue in particular about the preparation of consolidations, where if the work isn't done, um, it, it can end up being lost because there's all obviously detailed technical work that the drafter has to do to put the put the consolidation bill together. And there's, a, there's always a danger with consolidation bills that if you wait, that that, that work becomes lost because of further changes to update the law, uh, which can come from uh, you know across a range of different areas, and not not just necessarily, um, for instance, the, in this case, uh, the Scottish government's proposals to change bankruptcy law, but um, but other ad hoc consequential amendments that other legislation in other areas might be making to um, to the, the particular act in question. So that there's there's always a danger that you wait for the, the next set of policy reforms. Uh, so, so essentially the argument is, and I'm prepared to accept it, that after a major reform, there is normally a period of quiet while we wait to see whether it's appropriate to make further changes in the light of that reform, and that's probably the best period to make a consolidation if you're going to do it. Is that essentially the point that's being made? Yes, essentially. It's one thing, I, you know, for instance, in making the criminal procedure um, Oh, sorry. Consolidation. That, that sorry. policy changes were made before the consolidation provisions were made. I think maybe just just one other um, thing is that consolidation was an option um, at the time of the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act, um, uh, as as that act was implementing just about all of the SLC recommendations. Um, but the decision was made to enable those changes to be implemented and have a time to settle in before. Um, before consolidation, and, and that's the that, that's the reason that consolidation has been taken now. Thank you. I think it's, it's pretty helpful and, and, and uh, comprehensively got to the uh, next set of questions. I think we were going to ask on, on timing. So I think John, we've probably got to uh, to, to your section, please. Okay. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, as I understand it, the um, Scottish Law Commission had 38 recommendations in its 2013 report, and I think the majority of them have already uh, been introduced. Um, but one change that seems to be happening here is uh, concerning the protected trust deeds. So can you explain uh, why it's considered appropriate to bring uh, that uh, the protected trust deeds within this bill, which I understand is uh, restating what was in secondary legislation to become part of uh, primary legislation? Yes, I mean obviously what the what the bill does principally is to consolidate the, the material in the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985 as it's been amended from time to time and the bill obviously takes in the other legislation that's amended, the 1985 Act directly and then as you see it adds in the protected trustees regulations um, and that was recommended in the SLC report, um, recommendation 38. Um, in particular, I think the, the Commission note that the, the Law Society's view that the protected trustees regulations are core to the daily practice of insolvency law, um, and they took the view that because it's a complex body of law uh, and also too important to relegate to subordinate legislation, that it would be useful to include it in the main bankruptcy statute, and that's what the, the approach that the, that the bill takes, and, and certainly the government you know, supports that approach. Um, I mean, it's, it's considered that protected trustees are a, you know, a major alternate route into insolvency protection, and that 
that's sufficiently important to, to warrant inclusion in the primary legislation in this area. Um, it might also be worth saying that the, the provision for protected trustees is, has always been made under the, the bankruptcy statute and uh, you know, Schedule 5 to the, the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985 had provision for more detailed provision for protected trustees in the past um, and that's being again kept in the, the main bankruptcy statute um, and that's the approach that's that's being taken in the bill so it fits well within the framework of of the material that's being uh, consolidated in the bill um, and at, at the same time there's a need in this area to keep flexibility because of changes in the grant of voluntary trustees for the benefit of creditors um, which is what what this this these measures regulate and that's um, you know so that's also something that's been Maintained and consolidated in the bill, the powers for the, the Scottish ministers to change the area by regulations, if necessary. And, and yet, presumably, they were in secondary legislation yeah. consciously for a reason. They were not previously in primary legislation. Yes. Yeah, so, so, what has changed? Have they just become more important? I think the overall framework is, is seen as being important. So, some elements, for instance, the power to set forms in relation to those. Uh, to those regulations is going to be maintained in, in regulations, but the overall framework is more of that is to be added back. Um, it was a conscious decision in the Bankruptcy and Diligence etc. Scotland Act 2007 to take you know to take wider powers to adjust the the, the, the regulation of protected trustees, but that is because of this need to, to be able to react to changing practices on the ground in the, the different forms of trustees that debtors can grant um, advised by insolvency practitioners for the benefit of their creditors. So, so, I mean, how should we decide or how should anyone decide what goes in primary legislation and what goes in secondary legislation? That's a very good question. I suppose the, the overall importance of the, of the framework, um, there are some particular areas and I suppose the, you know, the the Delegated Powers Committee are peculiarly well placed to, to judge to judge that in terms of what you see from day to day in terms of forms, I suppose, commonly, um, and other aspects of legislation, for instance, updating values in, in legislation, one that's particularly relevant to the bankruptcy legislation. Uh, but, you know, I suppose those kind of measures are sometimes seen as more administrative or, or more minor, though they can be important in, in practice as well. But it, it's those kind of areas where flexibility is necessary, I suppose, that is one of you know, one one reason why um, why you might have things in subordinate legislation. Um, obviously, the actual overall effect and the, and the wider framework of the, the legislation, um, some of which here is being added back into the, the, the primary legislation, is is something. And, and in this area, because the protected trustee effectively has, has a similar um, effect to to sequestration, that's that's seen as worthy of being you know, put on the on put in the primary legislation. And I think it does come back to how far you see uh, full administration, bankruptcy, minimum asset process and protected trustees as all similar approaches. Um, being, them being there being the three, in, in some ways, choices for someone who can't repay their debts to get debt relief. Um, and, um, you know, what, why would two of them be in the primary legislation and one of them not? So it's, it's trying to bring in some level of consistency. Um, one of the changes that, um, that the committee may or may not remember from the 2013 regulations was to change the time period over which contributions were paid for protected trust deeds. What we did in Badass was bring full administration into the same time period. So we've actually tried to make the, the two um, options there more similar. Similarly, the use of the common financial tool for both. Um, so increasingly, they're looking like similar or similar options, and it's important, I think, that they're treated in the same way in legislation. Okay, thank you. And uh, continuing with the SLC recommendations, uh, I think there's one, it's recommendation one was only uh, partially implemented, and then 32 and 37, I believe, uh, are related to a section 104 order. Could you just explain about them and why they've been dealt with separately? Yes, I think if, in relation to the first. Law Commission recommendation that was basically to remove the, the words or interest when talking about a right or interest that the debtor has, which may vest in the trustee in sequestration. Um, 
and that was considered at the time of the 2014 Act and discussed in detail with the, the Scottish Law Commission. Um, essentially, there was a, a concern that if, if that had been implemented in, in all of the different areas where it had been considered by the Law Commission, that it may have inadvertently led to a, to a doubt in what transferred very much at the margins to the trustee in sequestration when the debtor was sequestrated and during the during the period of the sequestration. Um, it's a, a fairly te technical doubt, but um, for instance, in relation to a, a hope and a hope of succession or a, a bequest which the debtor may have expected to receive, there was there was a, a doubt at the margins that could have led in some of those some of those references may have cast doubt on whether or not um, in, in a peculiar set of circumstances that would have transferred to the trustee in sequestration the way the Bankruptcy Scotland Act intended and that that would have uh, altered the effect. But uh, you know, th that was considered with the Law Commission at the time and, uh, and the proposal that ended up going in the 2014 Act to I mean, some of the references um, to to stick to um, just referring to a legal right transferring. Um, that was taken forward in, in um, three of the, the references, but not, not for the others. Um, and that, you know, that was agreed, and that, that approach is maintained in the bill. Just, it felt a bit safer just to leave it as it was? Yes. Because I mean, there might be kind of consequences if, you, if it was changed? Yes, probably. exactly. Right, okay. yeah. um, to, and then 32 and 37. Yes, absolutely. To, to address the others, uh, I mean that that goes partly to to the provision that's included in the the section 104 order. Um, I would actually say it's, it's partly confusing in it uh, in terms of recommendation 32 because there isn't actually any there isn't actually any provision in the 104 order which gives effect to that. But essentially, um, because it's been superseded by the um, the repeal of measures for composition out of bankruptcy by the 2014 Act. But but what both of those recommendations would have done would mean to fix very minor errors, one introduced by the 1993 Bankruptcy um, Act and, and one by the, the 2007 Act, um, where um, in the case of Recommendation 37, which is the one that would be implemented in the Section 104 order, um, a, a minor part of that order would um, make consistent the, for the law in the law of England and Wales and Northern Ireland um, the, a particular cross-reference in the, in the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985 and the way that's that's been amended so that that and that would introduce a you know a level of consistency on that particular point so so that point is left for the 104 order rather than being included in the bill because it deals with the law of England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Yeah, so just to clarify for those of us that are, are people who are not terribly into all the legal side of it, I mean we're not actually changing the law in England, and Wales, and Northern Ireland. Is it, is it just making? It, it's, is it a kind of consequence of us changing the law here? Is, is that how it works? It's in consequence of us changing the law here, but we actually are. The, the 104 order actually will be changing the law in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, and that's precisely what that narrow aspect of it does to fill in that in gap. Practice, can you give an example? How, what would that actually mean? Uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the particular example is about, um, about concurring creditors who apply for, in, in relation to a debtor application for bankruptcy and, and filling in. The, the part of the rule of the law of England and Wales and Northern Ireland, which means that the limitation rules, which would mean that a creditor's claim would lapse because it had expired over a certain number of amount of time where the creditor hadn't pursued that, that there's provision in, in the Scottish sequestration rules to say that those limitation rules don't have effect because the sequestration has been um, entered into in Scotland. So it says that because the bankruptcy has happened, you don't have to worry about your a creditor's claims prescribe uh, creditor's claims ceasing to have effect, or you know they don't lapse in because of the rules in the law of England and Wales and Northern Ireland because the bankruptcy has been brought in Scotland. So that puts effectively puts the rules on hold um, because the bankruptcy has been. Been, has taken effect in Scotland. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Um, so, just to tie off the, 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 the 104, so the effect of the 104 is not a consolidation, it's a change in the law. Uh, there's three different things really that the 104 order does. Um, 
the, the first category is of the kind of change that I've just mentioned. It's filling in bits of the law of England and Wales and Northern Ireland where the 85 Act previously extended into the law of England and Wales and Northern Ireland. So it makes a few freestanding minor provisions of that nature. Um, the other things that the, the 104 order does is to amend the amend various statutes which apply across the UK, largely in reserved areas, just to update, for instance, references to the 1985 Act to become references to the Bill. And, um, and the third thing it does is to fill in a very minor part of Westminster procedure where the Bill maintains the powers of the Secretary of State to, um, to make various provision by subordinate legislation, for instance, in relation to fees on the reserve side. Um, right. Perhaps just to complete the 104 order, um, what effect does it have on the consolidation that's before us, and the 104 is outside that, um, if the 104 order does not pass or does not pass in a timely fashion? Does that in any sense invalidate or require any change to the consolidation bill that is before us, or is it essentially incidental? It is essentially incidental or I suppose more accurately perhaps say consequential on those changes but it, I mean it is an important part of the package and it, you know it's important that the 104 order is made and we've obviously been working with the the UK government for a while to you know to to you know, for the for the 104 order to to be put in place so it is an important part of the of the package in order to ensure that the overall package works but it, it the content of the bill doesn't depend on you know itself on those changes just to be absolutely clear, while the 104 and what it does is important, its passage or non-passage need not have any effect in the consolidation process that this committee and then Parliament is considering, it, it, whether it passes or not. Yeah. Essentially, that's right in terms of the content of the bill. Sorry, I sorry do forgive me. You're using a weasel word, which uh, is well, essential. Well, I'm going to come on to, to, to explain that. I mean, it, obviously, it's you know it's for Parliament to you know to decide that it's content that the material in the 1985 Act has been consolidated in what's brought forward. Now, as you know, as I explained, that there there are parts of the 85 Act which will effectively mm. be reproduced in the 104 order, and you know that that's part and parcel of the devolution settlement. That, that those aspects, and they they are fairly marginal aspects because we've been able to keep. The, um, and keep most of what is in the 85 Act in, in the Consolidation Bill um, together. Um, but the, there are these, these aspects, but there are aspects where, because of Section 29.2a of the Scotland Act and the restriction on legislative competence, the, you know, the Scottish Parliament can't make provision to change the law of England and Wales just as a matter of the devolution settlement. And, and that's something where the 104 order is the mechanism that, that is used for that. So. Am I correct in understanding that if for any reason the 104 order is not made, and I'm not suggesting that it won't be really, then we would drop back to the 1985 Act or we would drop back to something pre that? Yeah. Would there actually be a hole in the law? It would just... There would be a hole in the law of England and Wales, um, and, and that, I mean, that's it's it's a fairly marginal hole in the law, but it but it certainly would be a, it would be a small you know, workability difficulty in the law, and so yes, um, you know the, the the intention is that the, the package of measures passes, including the the 104 order. And, so the 104 is necessary to give the full range of powers and effective law, which yes. the package is intended to give, and we can't just drop back to the way it was previously written. I mean, I suppose if, if there was some, you know, problem in extremists, but I mean, we have no reason to expect that's the, the case, and you know, there, there are no concerns with the, our you know, UK government counterparts about the, you know, the timescale for the overall package of measures, which has obviously been planned for some time. But it, you know, in, in extremists, then then yes, I mean, it, it, you know, it, we wouldn't want to disrupt the law without the 104 order. Okay, I'm wondering whether I could then move you back perhaps to the consultation on the, on what we have in front of us and, and ask to what extent the accountant in bankruptcy and the Scottish Government were consulted about what should be consolidated, uh, literally what's in there and what isn't in there, please. Yeah, I mean, it, in terms of what's in the bill and what's, and what's not 
in the bill. I mean, you know, I suppose the you know the, the basic premise from which the consolidation project started was just to consolidate the you know, the 1985 Act, um, and that was the uh, you know that was the the reason why initially the um, the the Scottish government and the accountant in bankruptcy approached this um, because it was you know it was seen to be valuable to consolidate the the 1980 the 1985 Act material, and that's very much where where the proposal started from um, as part of the the consultation that the SLC undertook. Um, the proposal to add the protected trustees material was was um, was taken up, and you know, and that's supported by the by the Scottish government. So. Um, you know, in terms of you know wider process, uh, you know, I think that you know that's very much the you know the origin of the of the proposals, uh, and I don't you know I don't think it was ever seriously considered that that, um, that other material would would be added. Um, there are one or two areas, I suppose, and you know, in, as I think we would say, the, the wider law, for instance, the the, um, the debt arrangement scheme regulations, which you know which. Are, you know, arguably equally significant, for instance, in their, their overall effect to the protected trustees material, and which uh, you know where that could be considered. But I think that's very much seen as not part of the the, the bankruptcy statute, you know, and that's that's never where it's sat in law, and and uh, you know, so that I think that's uh, you know that's the, the you know the main thing to you know to see about where the you know the the material that's come forward in the bill has come from. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I just ask: Is the accountant and bankruptcy and the government the same entity for the purposes of this discussion? Um, that's a tricky question to answer officially. Do we have a separate view? No, we don't. We uh, we agree right. with the government's view. That, 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 that's fine. Helpful. Just put it, put that on the record. Thank you very much, indeed. Um, are there any? Comments or have there been any comments from stakeholders about the answer that you've just given me, Mr. Fisher? And, and are, are there any feel? Is there anybody out there who feels that we have missed a trick and we should have done something else? Not that we're aware of. I mean, obviously, the, the, you know, the committee's call for evidence, may unless something is thrown up. But there's nothing. There's no, been no proposals that, that we're aware of, um, and I, I'm not aware of anything that arose out of the, the SLC's consultation at the time, which yeah. proposed other measures for consolidation in this in this bill. Good. Thank you. It's good to see the measure of agreement. Um, I think I'm now going on to Stuart, is that right? I'm looking at the competence consolidation, am I not? Or am I going to John? Get enough of that. I think I've covered the point. Yeah, right, that's okay. fine. That's okay. If you're but comfortable with covered that, then I am going to John. You. Thank you. Back to myself then. Yes, right. please, sir. Thanks, yeah. Convener. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, confused there. Moving um, the, the, the whole move into more kind of general areas, um, making uh, practitioners aware, insolvency practitioners aware of, and other stakeholders perhaps, of this bill as and when it's passed. Will there be work done to kind of update people? Um, can I ask Alex to deal with this one? Sure. Well, I think we, um, AIB has, has made um, significant efforts to make stakeholders aware um, of the consolidation um, and of this bankruptcy legislation. Um, as examples, um, we've highlighted the, through um, news releases the, the initial introduction to the Parliament, and we've highlighted this on AIB's website. But probably more importantly, at, at a wide range of stakeholder meetings that AIB um, holds, um, it includes the Debt Insolvency Stakeholder Forum, um, which the, the, the progress on consolidation um, is a regular um, item for discussion. Um, and that forum um, has key st stakeholders from insolvency practitioner um, uh, sector, from money advice sector, from creditor sector. So we're, we're trying to keep in close touch with, with all of those groups. Um, we also um, host annual uh, open stakeholder sessions, um, AIB, on a, a, with workshops on a range of topics in Glasgow and in Edinburgh and in Inverness. They're, they're actually taking place in January, February um, this year. So that will be another opportunity to both communicate um, the information on the consolidation bill and, and receive any feedback from stakeholders. The feeling is people are actually pretty up to speed at the moment, those that are most interested, and so there won't need to be a special push after the, the Act has passed. I, I would have thought not. I think uh, people they, they will, be, will be up to speed on this. Well, not, not 
particularly it's a fairly small world we deal in. Yeah, yeah, um, right. now I'm talking about the, the industry part of the sector. There may be between 100 and 140 licensed insolvency practitioners in Scotland. Um, almost all of them will be members of ICAS or the IPA, um, and you know, the stakeholder communication channels are very easy and very quick with the, the fee-paid sector. Um, slightly harder to get to the, the free money advice sector, but again, we have good channels through Citizens Advice Scotland, through the Money Advice Service, the Money Advice Scotland, and so on. Okay, and, and then another separate subject. Um, I mean, I realise obviously that corporate insolvency is not included in this uh, because a lot of that, as I understand it, is reserved. Will there be any kind of parallel process for uh, consolidating that legislation? Um, there, there is a, a lot of interest amongst our stakeholders in the corporate insolvency world and our plans for that. And I'll pass over to Alex to give us you a, a brief outline of what we're planning to do on that in the next year or so. Well, we, um, we have a process of modernisation of corporate insolvency that's taken place. I think it's, it's correct to identify that that's broadly reserved, although not wholly um, reserved. Um, so we are... Um, there is two main streams of work that have been taken forward um, in relation to Scottish corporate insolvency uh, at the moment um, through a, a public services reform order. Um, we are making changes to the 1986 Act um, as it relates to Scottish insolvency processes to try and modernise the processes here and, and effectively bring these into line with other changes that have already been introduced for um, practitioners in England and Wales. Um, and that will effectively lay the foundation for the modernisation of Scottish corporate in insolvency rules. Um, practitioners have, ha have been you know, calling for this for a long time because of the mismatch of, of, um, of a, a, the, the practices um, for corporate insolvency. So that um, programme of work will be taken forward um, in parallel with, with modernisation of rules in England and Wales um, um, with the intention of having revised and modernised rules um, commencing at the same time. So when you say rules, that's not primary that's legislation? That's not primary legislation. No. So, so we, we have, we, the, the Public Services Reform Order makes changes to primary legislation in the 1986 Act as it applies to the devolved aspects of um, corporate insolvency. Um, the rules will then be secondary legislation that would cover um, the, the, the the relevant processes of um, administration, um, a, a receivership, and uh, winding up. Okay, thank you. And uh, the other area, going back to this uh, present bill, um, assuming it is passed, uh, what will happen then about uh, secondary legislation? Will there be a need for updating that as well? Yes, I mean that, that's that's part of the intention and in the, in the package is that, that by the. That for when the the bill comes into force, assuming it's is passed, that that the um, the subordinate legislation will will be consolidated, and we've done that reasonably recently in relation to the the reforms um, that the the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Act 2014 um, passed, which will, will help us with the, with the work involved in that. But that that will mean that there's a coherent set of rules between the bill and the subordinate legislation that that points to the bill. So um, although that might not be legal. Legally necessary that that will uh, that will give a you know a coherent package of measures for practitioners to, to look at in relation to the the effect of the new bill. So, so what kind of uh, process would that go through, and what kind of time scale would there be for that? Yeah, I mean the, the overall time scale, roughly for for I think for the the bill to come into come into force. Um, Granted, a fair wind would would be towards the end of the end of next year, and that would allow the, the, the Parliament to scrutinise the, the the package of uh, regulations and orders that's necessary in the autumn next year. Um, so, and there's probably any haven't the exact way that you cut up the different provisions. You know, can, could work in in different ways, but um, but uh, you know, there'll, there'll probably be you know certainly there'll be several different sets of of measures to be included in that. So. Okay, and stakeholders would get the opportunity to feed into that process. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thanks so much. Do we anticipate that involving any significant transitional arrangements? There are transitional arrangements provided for in, in the bill itself, um, which by and large means that the, the bill will apply for new sequestrations, that sequestrations applied to, apply, sorry, applied for or, uh, or for 
trust deeds granted after a commencement date, that commencement date towards the end of 2016, as I as I explained, and uh, and so that would be that would be the the, the transitional arrangement. So um, so um, so the, the current measures will continue to to apply to sequestrations and trust deeds, which are are in train at the moment. Right, if, forgive me, I, what I guess I'm trying to establish, and I did use a technical term, so I, forgive me. Um, I, I, am I right in hearing you then as saying that after a certain date we'll be on the new regime, yes. and up to that point, and the point will probably be the date of sequestration, we will be in the previous regime? Yes, I mean, there'll be a need, a continued need to, to look at the old regime for existing sequestrations, yeah. but um, it'll, it'll be the new sequestrations after that date that will that But they, to come back to my to. original question, you wouldn't yeah. anticipate those that were in the old regime being subject to some of the new rules because they're now in force? No. It would simply be a, a clean break. Yes. I'm sure would make sense. That's fine. Thank you very much. Stuart, do you have one final question? Uh, <laughs> I do, and it's just about the basically mechanical process. A decision has been made as to what legislative provisions are being consolidated and taken into the Consolidation Bill. And I'm parking 104 considerations. Let's not go there. We've covered that. Um, and I just wondered what check, independent of the drafter, in undertaking this very significant process of lifting from old legislation into new, there has been that covers three, three things. First of all, um, has someone independently verified that all the relevant provisions in what is claimed to be being consolidated have been transferred? Secondly, has the check included verifying that nothing out with what is claimed to be consolidated has inadvertently been transferred in the Consolidation Act? And finally, has someone independently verified that the transcription, leaving aside the broader issue of clarifying words, has correctly trans transferred the legal effect to the consolidated bill? In other words, given that someone has sat in a darkened room for a considerable period of time, making this transcription from the existing law to the new, what independent check has there been on that process? Because the, I have yet to meet someone who is not fallible. Yes, yes, and it, it, it's a long technical bill, so I mean, very much understand the question. I mean, it can certainly be seen. Obviously, this is a government bill, and the government's putting it forward. And you know, and we we have looked at the bill, and you know, we're happy that it's from our point of view that it's a consolidation. I don't know what degree of independence you know beyond that uh, you're looking for but uh, but I mean obviously the the parliamentary process is you know is part of that part of that scrutiny but uh, so I'm 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 really independent perhaps is not necessarily the word I'm focusing on just yeah. someone other than the person who's yes, been uh, doing that there has been somebody looking yes, looked over yeah. their shoulder subsequently yes. because it's not something I could do and hand on heart say. But I think it's important that the committee knows yeah. and perhaps hears just a little about yeah. who functionally, not in, yeah. as an individual named, uh, has looked at that process and satisfied themselves. Because I think that is essential to our being able to say to Parliament, this is a proper transcription. Well, certainly I can say, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, it, you know, this is a government bill and the, you know, the government's putting it forward the way that we, we put forward you know, any bill. So you know, although it's led by the drafter at the Law Commission and that's essential because of the nature of the consolidation work, um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a government bill and you know, it, has, it has obviously been checked by ourselves uh, you know, and, and the, the government's lawyers so, um, to that extent. Yes, but I'm back to the quis custodia at Ipsos Custodia. Is, you uh, know, who guards the guards? In other words, what separate, the thing I really want to hear is what separation is there between the person who's actually been charged with this lifting out of the existing legislation into the new and the person who has looked at that output. What separation has, is there between these people so that we've got the best possible assurance that somebody has, with a neutral point of view, not part of the process of making that transcription, um, given such professional assertion as it's possible to make, the transcription has been correctly undertaken. 
Yes, well, I mean, certainly, I mean, if 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 the law commission drafter is the guardian, then then you know, as part of you know our job as government lawyers in looking at the at the consolidation, then you know our you know role is to guard the guardians, and we have checked the bill to ensure that it, it matches these you know, your your three criteria. I suppose you'll get um, some reassurance on that when you have the draftsman in front of you. I mean, it's not as if he goes into a darkened room and doesn't consult any no. of his colleagues ever. And the SLC did publish a draft bill. Um, in the supporting papers, you'll see there's this curious thing called the table of derivations yep. and destinations, uh, which is allegedly there to make it easy for all of us to check that there is nothing in the new legislation that wasn't in the old legislation, and every bit of the old legislation has been taken forward into the new legislation. And there are people out there in the world, who, unfortunately, who will be spending their time going through the tables of derivations and destinations, and I'm sure will uh, bring it to our attention if they feel we've missed something. I just wanted to get it on the record. The question we will return to on another occasion. Convener. Thank you very much. It's just one other thing that, that I, I'm, I would like to go back to, and I recognise it is an element of going back to, um, whether we've necessarily got everything on the record that you might want to say about the law relating to reserve matters, although we've extensively discussed the 104. Um, is there any further explanation you'd like to give of how paragraph 7 to schedule 4 of the Scotland Act operates to allow the restatement? Yes, I mean, I would welcome the, the, the chance to put that on the, on the record. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's set out in the, the drafter's note in the bill, but it, but also, yeah, I mean, it's true to say that in some areas the bill does restate the law on reserved matters, uh, but, it, you know, it's not thereby beyond legislative competence, um, and that is, I suppose, slightly unusual for bills before the Parliament. Um, I mean, the thing to say is that I mean, that's specifically permitted by paragraph 7 of Schedule 4 um, to the, the Scotland Act 1998, um, and it's specifically provided in that provision in Schedule 4 that the law is restated specifically in remains reserved law. So, you know, for instance, you know, Westminster can can go in and, and change that law as, as, it, as it could before. Um, and you know, in, in wider terms of the you know the, the tests for for devolved legislation, the aim of the bill is otherwise, of course, the you know the consolidation of of existing law. You know, as a in this case, a, a fairly pure consolidation. So, um, so um, you know, accordingly, there isn't a, you know there isn't a problem from a legislative competence point of view with the bill. Um, you know, just to, to flag the particular matters of, of reserve law in case that. Um, that no, says, I mean, the, the law of reserve matters restated in the bill are principally the the, the provision and preferred debts in, in Schedule 3, um, and also about the recovery of excessive pension contributions and, and sequestration um, in sections 101 to 107, uh, and also in, in some other areas, um, just by virtue of the detail of the, the devolution settlement. And the, the great advantage of that approach from uh, for a consolidation bill is that, uh, you know, I think as I mentioned before, it does allow the great body of the what was in the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985 to be transferred to to the bill um, and kept together in the one place, which is you know which is fairly essential for uh, you know th this exercise. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for you putting that on the record, and of course, I have to say, as a former as a former student of some of this, but never bankruptcy, it's awfully useful if it is all in one place, at least at some point in one's studies. So, is there anything else, colleagues, that you would like to put on the record? I am conscious that this is partly a putting things on the record session, because I think we've probably finished with the questions that we had wanted to ask you. If you're comfortable with covering everything you were expecting, then thank you very much indeed for your evidence. And I'll briefly suspend this meeting to enable us to reorganise. Thank you.
würde. Uh, to return to agenda item three, which is the bankruptcy Scotland bill. The purpose of this item is to consider the Scottish Law Commission recommendations in relation to consolidation in this bill. Of the 38 SLC recommendations, 32 have already been given effect prior to this bill. Of the remaining six SLC recommendations, five have not been given effect to or not fully given effect to in the bill for technical legal reasons. Does the committee agree to that only SLC recommendation number 38, the inclusion and the consolidation of the law on protected trust deeds, formally falls within the committee's remit for scrutiny? Thank you. Does the committee agree to consider this recommendation in detail at subsequent meeting? Thank you. Takes us to agenda item four, which is again the Bankruptcy Scotland Bill, but this item is for the committee to consider whether the consolidation in parts one to four of the bill correctly restate the enactments being considered, uh, consolidated, and also whether the consolidation is clear, coherent, and consistent. The definitions used in parts one to four remain largely embedded in the provisions in which they appear in the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985, which is the 1985 Act. By contrast, the definition of debt advice and information package has been moved to the interpretation section. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter why the approach has been taken of moving the definition of debt advice and information package to the interpretation section of the bill? Certain matters in relation to consistency and clarity of the consolidation have been identified. Does the committee therefore agree to ask the drafter why the subject to wording which appears in section 52B1 of the 1985 Act has not been restated in section 21B1 of the bill and whether the provision as restated is sufficiently clear as regards to the qualifications set out in section 3 of the bill? Yes to consider whether replacing the words at the date of the presentation of the petition or as the case may be at the date of the debtor application is made in the definition of qualified creditor in section 7 with a defined term, for example, the relevant date would make this definition and the definition of qualified creditors clearer to the reader. Yes. Does the committee also agree to draw the attention of the drafter to the wording in section 8.1 of the bill, which restates the words a debtor application as any debtor application, and to ask for an explanation as to why this change has been made? Yes. Draw the attention of the drafter to the lack of consistency in drafting style between sections 11.1 and 2 and section 12.1 of the bill, which make almost an identical provision, and to suggest that, in the interest of consistency, it would be preferable for the same drafting approach to be taken. Yes. <coughs> Draw the attention of the drafter to the lack of consistency in drafting style between subsections 2, 3 and 4 of section 13, and to suggest, again, in the interest of consistency, it would be preferable for the same drafting approach to be taken. Yes. Yeah. It appears that section 16.6 of the bill goes further than section 7.4 of the 1985 Act, which it restates. Section 7.4 of the 1985 Act provides that the apparent insolvency of a Companies Act company <coughs> and any other entity in respect of which an enactment provides that sequestration is incompetent may be constituted under section 7. Section 16.6 of the bill, on the other hand, extends this also to a limited liability partnership in addition to the other entities. Does the committee agree to draw the attention of the drafter to this point and to ask for an explanation of why it is considered that section 16.6 of the bill properly restates section 7.4 of the 1985 Act? Yes. Section 16.7b seems to go further than section 7.2b of the 1985 Act, which it restates in that it provides for certain situ more situations in which a debtor's apparent insolvency will end up when the debts are paid off. Sorry, will end when the debts are paid off. Does the committee agree to draw the attention of the drafters to this point and to ask for an explanation of why it's considered that section 14, no, 16, 7b of the bill properly restates section 7, 2b of the 1985 Act? Yes. Section 22.5 of the bill provides that a sheriff must forthwith award sequestration on a petition presented under this section is satisfied on a number of points. One of the points at section 22.5d on which the sheriff must be satisfied is that 
in the case of a petition by a trustee, one, at least one of two specified conditions applies and two, the petition contains a declaration by the trustee that sequestration would be in the best interest of the creditors. The equivalent 1985 Act provision appears to require the sheriff to be satisfied on either one or the other, but not both. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter why section 225D requires the sheriff to be satisfied on both points set out in the subsection, while the equivalent provision of the 1985 Act appears to require the sheriff to be satisfied on one or other point, but not both? Yes. yes. Thank you. Section 23 of the bill provides the sequestration must not be awarded by the sheriff if, without delay, the debtor pays off the relevant debts. The equivalent 1985 Act provision uses the term forthwith rather than without delay. Elsewhere in the bill, the word forthwith is changed to without delay, and in one case changed to immediately. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter for further explanation as to why the word forthwith has been changed to without delay in section 23 and elsewhere in the bill, and to immediately in section 71A? Yes. Yes. And also uh, to ask the drafter to comment on what effect this has, is considered to have on the meaning of the relevant provisions and the consistency of the bill as a whole. Yes. In section 24.7, the name of the Debtors Scotland Act 1987 is incorrectly given an apostrophe. Does the committee agree to draw this point to the drafter's attention? Yes. yes. The use of the word, sorry, the phrase, fall asleep in section 27.12 of the bill appears unusual. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter to consider whether the use of the phrase fall asleep in section 27.12 is sufficiently clear to the reader or whether further explanation could be helpful? Yes. Section 32 of the bill restates section 17b1 to 8 of the 1985 Act. However, subsection 9 of section 17b does not appear to be restated in section 32 or anywhere else in the bill. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter for an explanation of whether and where section 17b9 of the 1985 Act is restated in the bill? Yes. yes. It appears the word have in section 46.4a may be an error, and this should instead be has. Does the committee agree to draw this point to the attention of the drafter? Yes. The words as soon as possible in section 23 of the 1980 Act have been restated as as soon as may be in section 48.5 of the bill. Does the committee agree to ask the drafter to explain why this change has been made and what effect it's considered to have on the meaning of the provision? Yes. yes. And finally, does the committee agree to draw the attention of the drafter to the wording of section 71.2 of the bill, which restates the words an application as any application, and to ask the, for an explanation as to why this change has been made? Yes. Thank you for your patience. That ends agenda item four. And we turn now to agenda item five, which is the Burial and Cremation Scotland Bill. This is an opportunity to invite an oral evidence on the delegated powers in that bill. And I welcome from the Scottish Government, Simon Cuthbert Kerr from the Burial Cremation Team Leader, uh, the Public Health Division, and Graham McClashan, who's the Principal Legal Officer, of Scottish Legal Government Legal Directorate. Uh, and I invite questions from members. And somebody's going to have to remind me who's going first. I am. I feared I might be. Just give me half a moment. Let's get back to the right questions. Um, good morning, gentlemen, and thank you for your patience. The bill contains a large number of delegated powers, as you won't need me to tell you, relative to its size. And many of the powers are very broad. There also appears to be some inconsistency between parts of the bill as to the amount of detail specified on the face and the amount left to be set out in subordinate legislation. Now, the Delegated Powers Memorandum explains that the approach regarding the delegation of the powers in the Bill is informed by the need to allow for flexibility and to make appropriate use of parliamentary time, and I think we would understand those concepts. Can you explain further why it's considered that taking such a large number of wide-ranging powers strikes this balance appropriately, please? I think in, in drafting the bill, the approach we've taken to delegated powers is to look at each instance uh, in its own right, uh, to consider at uh, each particular um, uh, policy uh, outcome whether delegated powers is the best way to achieve that. There are a number of delegated powers which do things like uh, prescribe the wording of forms or uh, uh, specify the type of information that's to be recorded in registers, and we feel that that's more appropriate for um, secondary legislation rather than primary legislation. 
There are also several delegated powers which we expect to use to set out fairly large and detailed uh, regulations about the operation of particular parts of the bill. Uh, for example, um, uh, Section 6 of the bill sets out um, a power for ministers to make regulations about the management of burial grounds. And that's very much the kind of thing that when we considered it, we felt that it was better to set out that level of detail, uh, and operational detail for that matter, uh, in secondary legislation. So I think overall the approach we've taken to the bill is to consider each, um, in, at each instance whether delegated powers was the right way to go versus putting detail and uh, specific detail on the face of the bill. So the, the overall approach we've taken um, has been to look at each, uh, each um, particular provision in its own right rather than to take, a, I suppose, a blanket approach whereby we say if the effect is X, then we will use delegated powers. If the effect is Y, then we will put it in the face of the bill. I think as a result, um, what we have in the bill as a whole is um, our delegated powers, where we feel that there is an appropriate balance between primary legislation, legislation and secondary legislation, and which also um, will best serve a particular policy outcome. Uh, I suspect that's the answer that the committee would have expected in the individual sections we will explore separately. I think I would merely observe at this stage that there do seem to be a lot more delegated powers in this than there are in many, which may be appropriate to the subject matter, but does perhaps surprise us and may surprise the policy committee in due course. Can I then pick up on the, on the particular issue, please, and this, but, but the generality of the fact that there are a significant number of criminal offences to be created by regulations. The powers in section 6, 10, 22, 38, 41, 55 and 70 all authorise the creation of criminal offences in regulations. And the Delegated Powers Memorandum provides little information as to how those powers are likely to be exercised um, or what activity is going to be criminalised. Um, why is it considered to be appropriate to do that, please? Well, certainly, um, we've, we've taken a few powers within each of the, the regulation making powers to create criminal offences in secondary legislation. Um, as um, Simon pointed out there, the, for example, the, the burial management uh, regulations in Section 6 contains a, a power to create criminal offences. And given the, the, the range of, of matters that could be covered in those regulations, we thought it appropriate to, to take a power to create criminal offences so that we could tailor those particular criminal offences to the content of the, the regulations themselves. Um, we also um, thought it appropriate to, to give an indication of the limit of, of the penalty as well. Um, they are all um, summarily triable in, in the courts and they're all subject to a maximum of a level uh, three penalty as well. So we felt that appropriate to, to set a limit on the, the the penalties that may be imposed in any criminal offences that we, we do create. Um, so, so I think really the, the, the main reason is to, to um, give us the flexibility to tailor the criminal offences uh, in relation to each particular set of regulations that we're going to bring forward, rather than take a, a sort of generic criminal offence about contravention of, of regulations. Um, that's, that, that was where we were coming from. On right. That. I'm wondering to what extent those who were drafting the bill gave thought to the fact that there is a general principle that it is Parliament that creates criminal offences in statute and it is not people who generate regulations who create criminal offences by regulation. I mean, we certainly do have other criminal offences on, on the face of the bill as well. It was just that in, in these particular examples in terms of the regulation-making powers, we, th we thought it was appropriate to, to take a power to, to, um, to set out the criminal offences um, in, in the regulations themselves. And I don't think it's completely un unusual. Um, I don't have specific examples to mind, but I, I certainly I'm aware that Secondary legislation do, does contain um, yes. criminal offences. Although I appreciate the general principles there, I don't think it's unusual um, for, for criminal offences to be created in secondary legislation. I, I wouldn't for one moment suggest that we haven't done it, mm -hmm. but I do as a parliamentarian worry that the idea that we've done it once means we can carry on doing it forever. Mm -hmm. um, exceptions, I think, should be regarded as exceptions. 
Could I also just express concern and ask, therefore, for, for, for some explanation of why it is that we now seem to have a class of criminal offence which is administrative or unlikely to be contentious? Because, again, I think, and I speak merely as one MSP, I'm not used to the concept of the criminal law being created on the basis that it's administrative or that it's unlikely to be contentious. I think that's actually precisely why MSPs are elected, um, because it's our job to sort those out on behalf of those who elect us. I mean, I, I take that point on, on board, convener, as, as perhaps um, just been conflated a wee bit in the, the delegated powers memo when we were talking about the content of, of, of the other parts of the regulations. I certainly didn't mean to suggest that criminal offences are in any way administrative or, or uncontroversial. I take that point on board. But we've still got the, the issue that you feel that they can be created extensively. Now, can, can I simply put again on, on the record, the fact that you've put the maximum penalty in the statute um, it, it's not just going to keep us happy. It's absolutely crucial. I, I'm, I'm grateful because this committee would have growled very, very seriously had they not been there. Um, but that doesn't alter the fact that you are taking within regulations the, the, the conduct which the man in the street, and I represent them, is going to say, well, if, if you don't do what the regulations say, then that's a criminal offence. And that's not the way the law of the land is generally written and not, a, not the way that I would want to see it, and I suspect my colleagues might come with me on that. Um, could I then just ask, and this is again the generality of this, in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, there seems to be a suggestion that some of these are kind of okay and could come through by negative procedure, because the government will have had to consult other people. Now, that's a fair point as far as it stands, but what is the logic in saying that the fact that the general public or some organisation or some particular group has been consulted is any substitute for parliamentary scrutiny and therefore justifies negative procedure rather than the affirmative procedure? I think, Convener, we've certainly not intended to um, suggest that um, consultation is, in fact, any um, substitute for parliamentary scrutiny. And I apologise if the, the Delegated Powers Memorandum is perhaps a little heavily, ha heavily written in, in that regard. Um, the intention, really, with the consultation was, was to offer Parliament some um, reassurance that any regulations which were laid um, had at least gone through a, consul a consultation process so that the regulations which were then laid at least reflected a consensus, a, a, a consensus viewpoint. Um, but just, just to reiterate, it was certainly not to intend that that was equivalent to or, or preferable to um, parliamentary scrutiny. Okay, let's, let's leave the generality there. Thank you. And if we can turn to Stuart Stevens. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. I, I want to start by just exploring some of the implications of Section 6 and the management of burial grounds. Um, and in, in particular, um, we've got regulations that uh, will allow uh, very extensive provisions, and there appear to be no particular boundaries uh, to the provisions, um, given that we're actually in an area of policy where we've had burial grounds for a long time. One might have thought that we have a pretty clear view as of now as to how to manage them. Uh, what particular justification is for the amount that's actually in uh, secondary legislation in this connection, uh, the management of burial grounds, where there's nothing particularly novel, I would have thought, about managing burial grounds? Um, I, th I think Section 6 specifically addresses uh, one of the recommendations made by the Burial and Cremation Review Group, which, as you'll know, uh, have made a lot of recommendations which have been taken forward in this bill. Um, in England and Wales, there's a piece of legislation called the Local Authority Cemeteries Order 1977, which sets out um, a framework for the management of burial grounds. Um, stakeholders in Scotland, burial authorities in Scotland, ha have long argued that while, as you say, there are very clear and well-established processes for the management of burial grounds, um, there's um, the, the, the lack of any central guidance or regulation setting out a framework uh, actually calls into question some of the approaches that they've taken. In particular, there's issues around um, how far burial authorities can go to maintain headstones, um, and burial authorities have asked us um, how, uh, during consultation 
that we set that out somewhere in the bill. Uh, similarly, um, the inconsistent approaches that are taken across the country uh, by various borough authorities are something else that we hope to address uh, in these regulations. So it's not necessarily that the regulations um, will introduce entirely new concepts. I think it will introduce um, valuable consistency. It will introduce um, a new framework. Uh, and I think it will also codify some of the practices um, that have been carried out for a number of years and which are, are thought to be uh, still fit for purpose. Um, do forgive me, but you, you, you have said it's well understood. You've said uh, that uh, you know what's going to be in that secondary legislation. Why is it therefore not in primary legislation if we, in effect, appear to know what it is we want to do? Why defer this matter to secondary legislation, which in the nature of things is not well, it's not capable of uh, amendment by Parliament. It's only capable of acceptance or rejection. Whereas if it were to be incorporated in the bill, it could be dealt with in a much more detailed uh, way by Parliament. I think one of, one of the, the reasons we've taken that approach is, is the level of detail that we would expect to see in any regulations. Um, the bill at Section 6 clearly does set out quite a lot of the detail, um, but we consider that to be the framework. Um, we think that there will be a lot more detail um, to be worked out uh, in that uh, process, and we think that regulations are um, a more suitable way to do that rather than on the, the face of the bill, given the nature um, and the extent of the detail that we would expect to see. Um, and just perhaps before moving on to another section of the bill, in, in particular as the section six touches on the issue of places to keep uh, bodies before burial, um, I, I take it it's not the intention that the secondary legislation that might touch on that would restrict the rights of families, for example, to keep the body as is traditionally often done in the front room from which it departs directly to burial? Uh, no, there's, there's nothing in the bill that would prevent that from happening. Uh, well, that's not quite my question. My question is, it, would the bill allow secondary legislation to be created that would restrict that right? Um, I, I don't, if I'm following your question, I don't think the bill would do that. Um, I, I mean, the, the section on places to keep bodies before burial, um, if I'm following the argument properly, is, is it section five of the bill? Um, and the intention there uh, was to uh, put burial authorities under a duty um, to provide somewhere where um, a body may be kept on a, a temporary basis before burial. Um, We've actually discussed this um, with um, burial authorities. This was intended to be a restatement of a power in the existing uh, Burial Ground Scotland Act 1855. But we've, currently, we've since um, discussed this with burial authorities to tell us that Section 5 is actually unnecessary because that situation no longer arises. Either the bill is brought directly to the, um, the burial ground by the family or by the funeral director and is buried as soon as possible thereafter. OK, let me move on to uh, Section 8. Uh, one in so far as it uh, re relates to suspension of uh, private burials. Um, the Delegated Powers Memorandum explains this would, power would only be used in emergency situations, uh, but we don't have much insight into what would constitute an emergency situation. The, um, I, think, I think the intention of that, uh, that section is really to uh, react to um, issues around public health, so pandemics and so on. Um, I think having, having looked at that section uh, since the bill has been published, I think we recognise that maybe there is a lack of detail there. And when you contrast it with section 70, for example, which very clearly states that, um, that the, the process is intended to be used uh, for, uh, in response to public health risks, um, we think that there's, there's probably scope at section 18 to make that much clearer. Uh, and perhaps there are three timings at which this might operate. First of all, where a private burial has already taken place, is it envisaged that it could be used to e exhume and move on public health grounds? That's question one. Question two is, could it be used once agreement has been given to the private burial taking place 
but before it has taken place, in other words, the corpse is waiting to be put in the private burial, and, and three, of course, is the obvious one where it, it, it's, it's done in a more neutral environment. But the first two in particular, would the scope of the way the bill is drafted uh, cover those two circumstances, i.e. where the burial has already taken place, but to cause that to be undone? And secondly, where permission is given, but the burial has not taken place yet. I think on the second point, where permission has been given, but the burial hasn't taken place, then the answer would be yes. Our policy intention would be that there might be instances where we would have to intervene to prevent that burial from taking place. In terms of the first point, um, to allow the body to be exhumed, uh, we don't think that, so that's certainly not the policy intention, um, and, and I wouldn't think that the bill would allow for that. Um, and, and moving on, it, ap it appears that section 70 uh, allows the ministers to suspend a wide range of legislation for the purposes of public health uh, requirements. Um, why, if that is the case, as that appears to cover what the intention of 18.1 is, why, why are the powers in both these places? I think when we were drafting the bill, um, given that this was the first time we were legislating for private burial, um, our intention was really to look at that as a distinct section of the bill. In doing that, we may inadvertently have, have provided for the, same, for the same effect in two separate places. But it, it kind of suggests that there are emergency situations covered by 18 that are beyond public health that's covered by 70. Is that the intention? No. It's not the intention. So the emergency situations envisaged in 18 relate to public health and to nothing else? Yes. So in that case, it might be that the government should consider whether it's necessary to have that provision in 18. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think we can consider that. That's a very different case. Thank you. Uh, right, I think that takes us on to John. Thank you. A convener. And uh, if I could look at uh, section 37, um, I mean, clearly the, the whole question of disposal of ashes uh, has been a very sensitive one and uh, created quite a public reaction. So I was interested that in section 37.1, it says the Scottish ministers may by regulations make provision about, and then it lists a number of things, including at C, the disposal of ashes by cremation authorities. I mean, I mean, this seems to me a hugely important issue, very sensitive, very much public awareness. Why is it in regulations rather than in the face of the bill? Broadly, broadly speaking, um, the intention of Section 37.1c is to allow cremation authorities to take action um, to dispose of ashes uh, where ashes have been left with them and have been left unclaimed. Um, it's not generally intended... Uh, to apply to um, how ashes would be ordinarily um, managed. The process that we intend to follow, uh, and this is very much in line with the recommendation made by Lord Bonamy's Infant Cremation Commission, is to redraft the cremation application form so that the applicant will have to specify what should happen to those ashes. And uh, the current draft of the form offers a number of different options, including the applicant retrieving them themselves or um, the funeral director retrieving them on their behalf or the um, uh, crematorium uh, holding on to those ashes until such time as the applicant and the family have made a decision about what happens. So that's very much the process we expect, uh, by which we expect ashes and what should happen to ashes uh, to be managed in, in, in each instance. However, we are aware of situations where um, ashes, for whatever reason, are left at crematoriums, and cremation authorities have uh, told us that they essentially have nothing, they, 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 have, they have no route to return them um, to any particular place other than the funeral director if, for example, they lose contact with the, the applicant or the family. So the intention of this, uh, the intention of 37.1c, is really to make clear that um, cremation authorities 
in the situation where ashes haven't been uh, collected, uh, either in line with um, how the applicant has expressed his or her wishes through the application form, or simply because they've been left behind, it would allow the crematorium to return those ashes to the funeral director, or in fact um, to take steps to bury the ashes or to um, scatter the ashes uh, within the grounds of the crematorium. I mean, I'm even more mystified now because you've explained pretty clearly and you've obviously thought, you and your colleagues have thought through what might happen and what, what the options are, which makes it even stranger for me that that couldn't be on the face of the bill. I mean, for example, if they have to hold on to the ashes for, say, five years and then take some action, you know, even that time period of five years is pretty critical and presumably could be in the face of the bill, could it not? I think the key to this is, is the new application form whereby the applicant will be asked to express what they want to happen to the ashes. Um, there's quite a range of options that could happen and to allow for that flexibility um, and to reflect the, the variety of potential outcomes, we have drafted this on the basis that we feel regulations are the way to go. Uh, nonetheless, we, could we can certainly consider whether that's something that is... is um, it's preferable and more appropriate to have on the face of the bill. Yeah, well, I appreciate if you're going to reflect on it because I've, I've certainly found it surprising and I just have a feeling that some of the relatives and families who have been involved in this kind of issue might find it a, a bit surprising as well. Just, yes, sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, John. Could I just, just reinforce the view that it, it certainly isn't obvious to me why, if you are clear what the policy is and its range and its scope, why that isn't in the legislation? I think it's clearly the moment you want to write a form, we, we well understand you know, that, that, that there are administrative things. Nobody has the slightest difficulty about that. But if you're clear in policy terms as to what it is you think you're trying to do, then surely we should be asking Parliament at this stage to agree with that or to disagree with that. Um, Convener, that's certainly um, <coughs> something we, we can look at. As, as I say, the approach that we took in drafting the bill was to allow for the diversity of potential um, situations and outcomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we felt that there was um, the need there for some flexibility, but that's certainly something that we can look at and to see whether it's better to have it on the face of the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and to kind of continue, the, the regulations that I understand it in section 37 are subject to the negative procedure, uh, whereas there are similar regulation uh, making powers in section 6, which is management of burial grounds, and they are subject to affirmative procedure. I just wonder why the difference between these two? Uh, well, the, the existing cremation regulations under uh, the, the 1902 Act are subject to negative procedure and they have a similar range of coverage to the, the power that we're, we're taking just now. So it was, it was felt appropriate, I think, that we, that we attach the same procedure to it. Um, no two. Sorry, the 1902, sorry, the Commission Act 1902. Which um, does seem rather a long time ago. I mean, I just wondered if uh, maybe the view of cremation, is, given the light of some recent events, might have changed? Yes, certainly. I can uh, certainly remember. We can, we can reflect on, on these things. And, uh, okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, the other area I wanted to touch on is really the following two sections, 38 and 39. And really kind of how they relate to each other, because 39 is pretty clear uh, about offence offences, in fact, referring back to Section 38 offences. Uh, and, for example, says a person commits an offence if the person provides information in or in connection with an application uh, which the person knows to be false or misleading in a material way. So that, that's fine, and that's pretty clear. What I then found a little bit puzzling, though, was going back to section 38, where it says application for cremation. Um, subsection 2, the Scottish ministers may, by regulations, make provision for or in connection with an application entitled in subsection 1. And then it goes on, regulations, uh, the subsection 4, regulations under subsection 2 may, in particular, lists a number of things, including at G, create criminal offences uh, to be triable, etc. So, Again, I've got this question, why, if, if we've got this, the, the pretty clear section 39, why do we need 38 uh, 4G? I mean, I think it, it was, as we sort of stated at the, the outset, in terms of the sort of general approach to, 
uh, to regulation making powers, we had sort of thought about um, you know, having the flexibility to create criminal offences to relate in particular to the particular re regulations that we're bringing forward in relation to applications. Um, so again, it was to provide that flexibility, but um, I can certainly see how we have a, a specific offence in section 39. So I mean, it, it may be again that we we reflect um, as to whether whether or not that power to create criminal offences in 38 is, is necessary. We can see whether uh, you know, th there's anything that 39 doesn't cover that we yes. need for the regulations, but we can certainly reflect on that. Well, that, I mean, that would be my supplementary question, because it, it kind of implies that yeah. there might be other criminal offences, and I think you've already got from the convener that we're not wildly enthusiastic about criminal offences being created by regulation. Um, and so, I mean, I think we would be interested to see if there were any examples of other criminal offences other than the very clear ones in, in Section 39. Okay, that's me. Thank you. Section 16, Stuart. Um, yes, just a, a, a little bit on <coughs> Section 60 in particular in relation to the powers uh, conferred upon inspectors. Uh, as presently drafted, there appears to be absolutely no limit to the powers that could be conferred uh, upon inspectors. And the example that came to my mind that might be at the margins is if an inspector... Um, uh, was able specifically to go and inspect uh, a coffin before burial to make sure there were no stolen goods being buried, uh, which would appear to be beyond what one would imagine, but which would appear uh, to be permitted by the regulations that you could bring in under this, this power. I mean, why aren't there more specific provisions as to the limits uh, of the, 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 the powers that an inspector might have. Sure. Um, well, I think the, um, the, way that the, the way that we structured the bill was, was really that um, the, um, the, the, the framework for the powers of the inspectors uh, are really set out between sections uh, 61 and 64, um, so it's, it's certainly not the intention that we would use the inspector to, um, for, for the sort of purpose um, that, that, you, that you highlight, although I see the, the general point that you're making. We would certainly view um, the framework of the uh, inspection regime to be set out between section 61 and 64. We would clearly see it to be uh, about the, um, the processes which are used by various parties in the funeral, uh, the funeral industry about the quality of services which are provided. Um, and that's, again, that's why we've used um, regulations for that, for that process, because there's a level of detail which we feel is required um, to give effect to the broad framework which is set out in the bill. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm questioning the need for there to be perhaps a relatively broad framework, but merely wondering why the bill is relatively silent on the boundaries of the powers that might be given to inspectors. Um, I mean, you get unexpected effects. From ancient history of my own life, when I was a water bailiff, I, I had the power to enter any premise without cause shown, um, without any particular purpose being described. I'd, and I don't think that was regarded as satisfactory, and it was corrected in later legislation. This kind of smells much the same way, that while I'm relatively confident that no government would be likely to give um, the inspectors powers uh, that the police could only dream of having, um, would it not be helpful for the primary legislation to perhaps draw some boundaries around the powers that might be given before um, a government of whatever hue in future looks at the regulations that might be drawn up. I mean, I, I think, going back to the example you just cited there about powers of entry and inspection, we do have those set out on the face of the bill at section 62, and they are you know, limited to um, the management or operation of burial authorities, cremation authorities, or businesses of funeral directors. So we do have fairly specific powers of entry set out on the face of the bill. That's not going to be for uh, regulations at all. Um, and, and also, you know, I think we would be intending possibly to exercise um, the powers in section 1661 in, in one set of regulations, are both subject to affirmative procedure, and therefore that would give you the complete 
picture in terms of what, what functions inspectors would have. And I do think in terms of section 61, we do have um, examples of how that power may be exercised. And it, you know, it gives it gives a bit more flavour as to the, the sorts of things that inspectors will be doing um, in terms of you know, frequency of inspections carried out, um, reports by inspectors in relation to inspectors, um, steps that they may they take in terms of enforcement, etc. So we do, in terms of the power in section 61, that does sort of set out examples of the, the types of functions that we'd expect inspectors to have in relation to inspections. It may be a structural thing. I mean, I can see that Section 60 does sort of stick out on its on its own. It may be that we kind of reflect about the structure of, of Section 60 and 61 to see whether we can make um, make the powers a bit a bit clearer in that respect. Um, we can certainly reflect on that. There's a. It, it is not this committee's purpose to actually worry about the policies, as you will appreciate. But it is our concern always to see whether or not the way anything's been drafted, <coughs> that the boundaries are clear and the boundaries are therefore in a reasonable place in terms of what the policy might be, even if it's not our job to worry about what the policy specifically is. So again, every time you say, well, this section sets out the following things and the word management appeared in there. I guess I would want to say, well, do, are we clear what management means? Could it actually be wider than you're really intending? Because if it could, then maybe there should be some other constraints in the text in order to, to limit what the regulations could cover. Because I would suggest to you that's the principle which we as parliamentarians, forgive me, I'm getting rather philosophical this morning, but you know, we are in the business of giving the government powers. And we only want to give them the powers that they ask for, which we're happy for them to have. We're not in the business of giving them open-ended powers to do things that they might happen to think is appropriate. That's not what Parliament does. On that happy note, Richard, please. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Convener, and, and continuing the, the same uh, theme. The, the Delegated Powers Memorandum describes the creation of a licence regime to apply to funeral directors uh, as both extensive and administrative. Uh, the creation of a licensing regime to apply to an industry which currently operates on an unlicensed basis could have significant impact on individuals who operate as funeral directors. And given that context, can you then explain further why it's considered appropriate to delegate this matter as well almost entirely to regulations? The approach we've taken with, with the, the potential licensing scheme is, is one where we have a very clear uh, model in mind uh, of how that might operate. And that's um, set out in the financial memorandum, for example, or financial estimates are based on a particular model. However, at the moment, as you state, there um, is, is no licensing, licensing whatsoever. There's also very little external scrutiny of uh, funeral directors. The policy intention, therefore, is to introduce um, inspectors who would then undertake um, both inspection of individual funeral directors, but also um, take a, a, an overall perspective on funeral directors as an industry and consider why, whether further licensing, uh, or in fact licensing indeed, uh, might be necessary. The approach we've taken in setting out the, the um, regulation making power is to put the scheme within a very clear framework but give it sufficient flexibility so that any recommendations inspectors might make as to the shape or form or functioning of the licensing scheme could be given effect. I, mean, I appreciate the, 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 the policy intention clearly but the, 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 the matter in hand is why it should be so much a matter for regulation rather than on the face of the bill when, again, you said that the government's sort of got a clear model in mind of how this would operate. And, you know, the, the context here is that, you know, we, we know of, of the other um, licensing schemes which have been set out more fully in primary legislation. So the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982, the Licensing Scotland Act 2005, most recently, just this year, the Air Weapons Licensing Scotland Act 2015. So, you know, what distinguishes this licensing regime which will be in place, or funeral directors' premises, from those other licensing regimes, uh, that means it's more appropriate for this regime specifically to be sort of regulation rather than on the face of the bill. And again, you said you have a clear model in mind. 
We do have a clear model in mind, but um, as I mentioned in my previous answer, it's a model which may well have to change on the basis of um, the inspection regime and any recommendations which are subsequently made by, um, by inspectors. We did... That applies to the other regimes I, I, I took you through as well, though. I mean, there must be similar circumstances in those regimes, and yet you know, those regimes you know, are much more substantially in the face of prime legislation. We've certainly looked at those other regimes in, in um, trying to develop models and approaches uh, to this. The approach, I think, I think one of the key differences between the various schemes that you mentioned and this one is that we feel that this can be operated um, by the Scottish Government rather than um, putting it to local authorities. We feel that we can um, achieve our policy intentions um, with a relatively unbureaucratic um, system. Um, which therefore we think doesn't need um, the scale um, of, of scheme that some other licensing regimes have, have created. In particular, the approach that we've taken so far and the examination we've done of other schemes suggests that those schemes are, are much bigger and um, have, have um, far bigger bureaucracies around them than we feel might be necessary for the approach that uh, we intend to take. Okay, I want to move on to um, section 67, which creates a power for... So you want to come back on that, Stuart? It was on that point. Uh, yes, it is specific. Play it on, on, on the point we've just been covering. Um, given that we're talking about licensing funeral directors rather than the activities that funeral de directors undertake, almost all the activities, and the only exception I've got in my mind might be embalming, that a funeral director undertakes can be undertaken by a private individual, is it envisaged that the regulations would catch private individuals who undertake activities such as laying out and the activities around that, arranging uh, for the burial and indeed transporting the remains to the place of burial, even, you know, virtually every step could be undertaken by private individuals. Are these to be outside the regulations rather than inside? And if they're outside as a private individual, why should they be inside regulations for? In other words, what powers in relation to secondary legislation, what's the scope intended to be? The approach we're taking is that particular activities should be, should be licensed, um, whether those activities are laying out of the body um, as you mentioned, or transporting the body from one place to, the, to another. I think those are examples of functions which we probably would want to consider within a licensing scheme because it's about the, um, the ensuring that the deceased is, is treated appropriately and with dignity uh, in a way that at the moment we don't know the extent of how much dignity and respect uh, the deceased is treated with simply because there's almost no external scrutiny of funeral directors. So rather than perhaps looking at funeral directors uh, as, as, as a specific function, I think we have in mind um, specific activities being carried out in relation to funerals. And so we would look, therefore, not simply, I think, uh, to licence funeral directors, um, as recognised by the general public, but anyone who is carrying out particular tasks. So, so the intention uh, of the scope that this piece of secondary legislation might cover could be to cover an individual, traditionally it was done in the, the deceased's home, doing the laying out. It could be to cover... I don't know if this is now done, although when I was a nurse it certainly was, uh, a nurse doing the laying out in a hospital before collection by an undertaker. So it's the intention that the scope of these pieces of secondary legislation covers these activities which are, I'm not saying they're particularly common, but in rural communities and island communities, I can well see them being undertaken by people other than funeral directors. So the intention is that there be powers for secondary legislation to cover these activities uh, that private individuals might undertake in exchange for no reward whatsoever of a financial or equivalent to financial sense. I think I'll ask my colleague to answer that point. 
Well, I think as uh, the powers are set out at the minute, um, they, they do relate to where a funeral director carries on a business. So I think that's, that's how the powers are set out at the minute in terms of the scope of the licence and scheme. Um, so, uh, yeah, on a, on a, on a the, reading of them just now... They, so they this, in them. essence, is creating the power to create regulations to the limited circumstances where someone is undertaking these activities for reward. Yes, uh, uh, that's the intention. On a, carrying on a business, that's, that's certainly how the powers are reflected well, at the minute. Well, just, just to be clear in, in my mind, it's for reward would be the test. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not looking at the draft that I'm in front of me. I'm, I think so. I think to, to look at the examples that, that you gave, um, a nurse who was laying out the body in a hospital, I don't think anybody would regard them as carrying out funeral-related activities. I think they're doing their job as a nurse. Um, somebody in a rural communi community, and we very much th considered the diversity of um, funeral businesses, um, and, and they vary from you know, massive... Um, uh, organisations down to people who do a handful of, of, of uh, funerals each year and whose main business is something else entirely. I think what we would want to capture with this is, is anybody who is doing this um, essentially as a business, whether that's um, a small element of their business, they'll offer to transport the deceased from the hospital to the home for a small sum of money, I think that's something that we really need to... Con I think we, the, 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 the key policy aim here is to ensure that that kind of function is done properly. So if somebody is charging for that kind of service, then from a policy perspective, that's certainly something that I think we should be considering within the scope of this. So, so we as a committee are only interested in how powers derive to, to, to create secondary legislation. So... Am I clear that the intention in policy terms is that the, se the secondary legislation will apply only powers to bring forward secondary legislation will exist in relation to someone who is undertaking these activities for reward? Right. Yes, uh, yeah, I mean, the licence scheme is in relation to funeral directors' premises, and um, that test is laid out in section 65.2 and it's uh, premises that are owned or occupied by a funeral director and used primarily for the carrying out of a funeral director's business, okay. which would suggest rewards. Um. Forgive me. We are, yeah, forgive me, John. Can I, can I do mine, but I will come to you in a moment. Uh, if you're talking about the premises, but we're not un talking about the undertaker or the activities, then surely most of the transport can't be covered. Yes, uh -huh. we've, all, we've also, yeah, 652B2 talks also about premises that are used primarily for the carrying out of any activities relating to the funeral director's business. So that may suggest the sort of element of, of yeah. the, the hearses being used. Forgive me, I haven't got that detail in my head. That makes perfectly good sense. Mm -hmm. Is there then a risk that there's going to be some place, some door within a hospital beyond which the nurse won't go because somehow that's somebody else's job and you have to be licensed to go there? I, sh I shouldn't think so because I don't think that, that type of scenario would be regarded as the bill is constructed as being primarily used by the funeral director or for the funeral director's business. It would certainly be something that was used in relation to the deceased but not necessarily used primarily by a funeral director or as part of that funeral director's business. Okay, let me leave it there. John, did you want to just come in on this one? It's related. So, I mean, theoretically, and this may not co commonly happen, but somebody could be a full-time funeral director, that's their living, but they have no premises, so they wouldn't need a licence? Well, the way the, the, the power is drafted at the minute is related to licences for funeral directors' premises uh, and the carrying out of their business on that premises. So. That's, that's, how, that's how we've looked right, so, at it. So it's very much the premises, it's not the, the person or the activity, right? It's, as, as it's laid out in the bill on introduction, that's, Thank that's you. how we... Collectively straying fairly close to policy here, but I think we're bringing up some interesting points which you might like to reflect on. Uh, Richard, shall we come back to, I think, go to practice?
Yes, we'll Thank you. take you to section 67, which creates a power for Scottish ministers to issue codes of practice regarding exercise of functions by burial authorities, cremation authorities and funeral uh, directors. Uh, now, section 67.5 states that a burial authority, cremation authority or funeral director must comply with any applicable code of practice. But why is it considered appropriate to issue a legally binding code of practice without any form of parliamentary procedure being attached to that co code? And, and given that, how is it expected that compliance with that, that code will actually be enforced? Um, well, I mean, there is parliamentary procedure in that the, the code of practice, when it's published, is laid before the Scottish Parliament. I appreciate it's not a negative or affirmative procedure at all, but there is, there is a publication element to the codes of practice. Um, I can't comment on the policy intention, but it was just to point out that that part of the provision. In terms of compliance with the Code of Practice, we would expect that to fall to the inspectors. And it, so to the inspectors will, will, will enforce the regime with the appropriate penalties and the appropriate... Indeed, yes. Um, but in terms of the, um, the Code itself, it should be a matter for, for publication for Parliament with no, at the moment, proposal that we're able to amend it or reject it or... Mm -hmm. Any, any um, procedure beyond that? Well, certainly, that's how the, the bill was reflected at the minute. It's, it's publication. The section 68 um, provides for consultation before the code of practice is, is published um, in terms of consulting with the, the people affected by it. Um, but certainly, in terms of parliamentary procedure, it is a, a laying before the Scottish Parliament in terms of section 67. Um, Sorry. Sorry, I'm just going to add to that. I think, I think in drafting this, um, we, we had particular consideration to uh, particular recommendations made by Lord Bonamy in terms of codes of practice that should be issued um, to various parts of the, to, to the, the funeral industry. Now, I know that many of, those funeral, uh, many of those codes of practice have now been developed with stakeholders are in, uh, and are in place. And I think what we sought to do with section 67 and section 68 was really try to give some sort of statutory footing to those codes of practice, to, to, to just try to, to underline uh, their importance and to try and underline the, the, um, the value of um, various stakeholders complying with them. Subsection 67.1 A, B and C talks about the carrying out by a burial authority of functions, the carrying out by a cremation authority, the carrying out of the functions of a funeral director. I think in drafting this we had a mind to the codes of practice working in conjunction with regulations that we've set out elsewhere. In hindsight, however, I can see that there is perhaps an issue there where there's perhaps in trying to make a... In trying to provide additional strength to the codes of practice, we may have inadvertently actually made it slightly less uh, secure in that there's, 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 you know, there's, there's no um, full scrutiny by Parliament. So I think in hindsight, that's certainly something that we could, we could look again at. So you'll that further? I think, I think, I think, we, I think we will, yes. Publication. Uh, if I just extend that though on, on that point, uh, and forgive me, this, this is a jurisprudence morning, but since when has legislation been to underline something in importance? Hey, sorry, I may, I may, I may, I may simply have, have, have mis-expressed the policy intention there. Uh, I think, I think uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that, um, given that the codes of practice um, are already coming into force, we feel that there's actually value in putting them and uh, actually giving a statutory um, footing to those codes of practice. I may, I may slightly just have, have um, um, mis-expressed um, yeah, for, what goes me, first and apologise for I'm, that. I'm not trying to pick over your words particularly, and, uh, and forgive me if, if that was the impression I gave. It, it was more a matter of if something doesn't have a procedure for the enforcement of it, then saying it's in, enforceable doesn't actually help. Enforceable uh, in terms of compliance if you have with to a comply code of practice. With something, then unless there's some repercussion for not complying with it that's on the face of what you're dealing with, then why is it there? Well, I've, sorry. If I could just sort of jump in there, it was section 61 in terms of the regulations that can be made in relation to inspectors. Simon mentioned that it was the intention that uh, inspectors enforce um, the legislation and the codes of practice. There is a specific power in section 61.3 
um, where we illustrate all the, the matters that may be covered in the regulations. There is one that relates to steps that may be taken by inspectors for the purpose of ensuring compliance with requirements or conditions contained in the enactments, codes of practice or guidance applicable to the bodies. So that would be where the enforcement part of it would come in, would be in terms of functions placed on inspectors under the inspection regulations. So that's where the, the link is, is made between the two. Right, and, and with you there, could you then please just elucidate what the powers of the inspector are to enforce that? Well, that's something that would be expanded in, in the regulations themselves in terms of the steps that they may take to comply with them. Um, so that would be something for the secondary legislation that we'd have to consider in the light of the, the models of inspection that we're considering at the moment. Right, so, so we may in time, and I hesitate to draw the analogy, get finished up in the same kind of place as factory inspectors who might have the ability to stop something from happening, might have the ability to prosecute something, might have... The, but all of that's going to come in a regulation. I, I, th I think from, from a policy perspective, uh, I think that would be uh, the intention. And I think, as Graham has explained, we would uh, look to set that out in more detail in regulations. Right. Thank you. OK, thank you, Richard. I was going to move on, but I think, obviously, you, you made a point you're going to reflect further on simple publication or laying before Parliament of the Code of Practice. I think that's welcome. I'm sure the committee might want to return to that in future as well. Um, my next question is on um, the application of the, of the provision of this bill to uh, future circumstances and new methods of disposal of human remains as, uh, as practice develops in this area. Uh, and um, why that decision has been made that it should be this bill and the provisions of this bill applying to such practices rather than introducing prime legislation on this matter at such time in the future as is considered necessary when these practices uh, um, evolve. Can you explain further which provisions of this bill also would be likely to be applied um, in respect of any new methods of disposal of human remains? Um, I think um, we, we've, we've, uh, we've drafted this section very much with the eye uh, on, on future proofing the bill. There are a number of different um, techniques for disposing of human remains which are either in use in other countries um, or are being developed. Um, as far as we're aware, there's no particular barrier to any of those techniques being implemented. So, for example, resumation is a process whereby the body is, is dissolved uh, in a chemical solution and you're left with bones which are then ground up to make ashes. There's various uh, states in, in the USA where that's already used. We're aware that some um, companies in, in Scotland are interested in that. Um, as far as we're aware, there's nothing to prevent them offering that service at the moment. We think that the power in the bill will mean that if anybody does bring forward such a, a technology and uh, starts to offer it, we would be able to very quickly regulate that process. It doesn't preclude um, primary legislation being brought forward uh, to cover that specifically, but it's certainly intended to allow um, a process um, to be regulated for, at least in the short term. In terms of what particular parts of the bill um, it would apply to, I think that would depend on the particular um, technology that was introduced. So, for example, to use resumation again, resumation is, is arguably more close to cremation than it is to burial. So perhaps uh, if resumation was uh, offered uh, by a, a cremation authority or a burial authority or a funeral director, those parts of the bill which relate to cremation and which then could uh, be read across to relate to resumation might be the parts of the bill which were um, uh, um, used in that, in that way. Thank you. I've just got one okay, final just question. Just just no one's got any further complete. points on, on that area. Uh, my final question is in relation to Section 70, and it comes back to the issue of um, the creation of penalties and, uh, and whether they're in regulation on the face of the bill. Um, Section 70 permits the suspension of certain enactments where ministers consider such action to be necessary or expedient for the purpose of protecting public health, and such regulations may include provision creating criminal offences punishable in this instance by a fine. The regulations may also impose other penalties or sanctions in respect of any contravention of or failure to comply with specified provisions. Now, these additional sanctions, penalties, again, they, they answered out on the face of the bill. So why is it appropriate to take a power to 
impose unspecified penalties or sanctions for non-compliance in addition to any criminal offences? And why are these additional penalties or sanctions again not set out on the face of the bill? The, the, the additional sanctions in uh, sorry, section 73C. Um, well, I mean, again, I think the answer was to, um, to create flexibility to allow us to respond to emergency situations and beyond creating sort of criminal offences, we may need that flexibility to impose other sanctions in an emergency situation. What emergency situation would you foresee then? Because presumably if it was an emergency covering, you know, kind of 24, 48 hour time scale, then even the fact that regulation isn't gonna, is going to help in that, in that circumstance. So I, I'd be interested to know what sort of what sort of circumstance you, you, you foresaw in terms of that emergency situation? I mean, certainly we can, we can reflect on this as well. I don't have a specific example. I mean, obviously we, we would need to respond to specific circumstances that are unforeseen uh, and therefore it, it's kind of hard to come up with a specific okay. example on the spot, but certainly we can, we can reflect on your point. Well, that's appreciated. I, mean, I think it comes back to the, the, the general point that you, that you made at the beginning of the meeting around you know, whether it's appropriate for some of these um, issues to be uh, in regulation rather than the face of the bill itself. Yes, and I would just ask, and I have no idea where the answer might be, but presumably the government does have some statutory powers to do some fairly extreme things in emergencies, and it does seem to me the kind of thing you're talking about might well be covered by pre-existing legislation, which sounds a far better place to have it than in regulations in Section 70. Um, but I think... You will reflect on that, as you will on many other things. So, very grateful. I think that's the end of our questioning. So, can I thank you very much indeed for coming along and for your illuminating answers. Thank you. And I'll just briefly suspend for a couple of minutes. So agenda item six, which is instrument subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Adoption and Children's Scotland Act 2007, Amendment to the Children's Scotland Act 1995, Order 2016, Draft, nor on the Justice of the Peace Courts, Special Measures, Scotland, Order 2015, Draft. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Yes. yes. Okay. Agenda item seven is instrument subject to negative procedure. <clears throat> and again, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the designation of nitrate vulnerable zones, Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 376, nor the Snares Training, Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015, 377, nor the Sheriff Appeal Court Fees Order 2015, SSI 2015, 379, nor the Civil Legal Aid, Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 380, nor the Scottish Tribunal's Eligibility for Appointment Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 381. Is the committee content with these, please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item eight, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, commencement number five, transitional and saving provisions order 2015, SSI 2015, 378. Is the committee content with this instrument, please? Yes. Thank you.
Agenda item nine is the Lobbying of Scotland Bill. Are members are invited to consider the delegated powers provisions in this bill. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the Scottish Government on the delegated powers in the bill in written correspondence. And the committee will consider the responses at a future meeting to inform a draft report. Sections 15, 1, 21 and 41 all relate to powers exercisable by resolution of the Parliament. Section 47 of the Bill makes general provision in relation to these powers. The Committee may wish to seek explanation in relation to three points. Firstly, the Delegated Powers Memorandum does not explain the type of procedural detail which could be included in Parliament's standing orders on making parliamentary resolutions. Secondly, Section 47.2b confers wide power to make ancillary provision under such parliamentary resolutions. The Delegated Powers Memorandum does not explain why this is needed. And lastly, Section 47.4 provides that Part one of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform 20, Act 2010 is to apply to a resolution if, as if it were a Scottish instrument. The purpose of this is not explained again by the Derogated Powers Memorandum. Does the Committee agree to ask the Scottish Government, one, what further procedural provision is envisaged to be required in the Parliament's standing orders, why it's considered appropriate for these matters are subject to provision made in the standing orders rather than set out on the face of the Bill? Two, section 47.2b confers power on the Parliament to make the full range of ancillary provision in a resolution under the Bill. Why is that considered appropriate? Can the Scottish Government give an example of the sort of provision it is envisaged might be made under the ancillary power? And three, section 47.4 of the Bill provides that part one of the Interpretation and Legislative Scotland, Legislative Scotland Act 2010 pardon me, is to apply to a resolution as if it were a Scottish instrument. Does the Scottish Government explain can the Scottish Government explain the purpose of this revision, please? Is Gunity content with those three questions? Thank you. Yes, that's section 15.2 enables primary legislation in sections 4 to 14 of the Bill to be modified by a parliamentary resolution made under section 15.1. Does the Committee agree to ask the Scottish Government one, to explain why, further why it is considered appropriate for the Parliament to have a delegated power to modify provisions of the Act as passed. Two, regarding the choice of procedure, why it's considered appropriate that the power of Section 15.1 is exercised by parliamentary resolution, notwithstanding that it includes provision to modify <coughs> primary legislation. Yes. Part three of the Bill makes provision for the investigation of complaints and reporting to Parliament by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland as part of the oversight of the registration regime. Section 31.1 makes that, provides that the Commissioner, in carrying out those functions, must comply with any direction given by Parliament. Section 24.5a empowers the Parliament to specify in a direction classes of case in relation to which the Commissioner is required to report to Parliament in specific circumstances. Does the Committee agree to ask the Scottish Government, one, in relation to the power in Section 31, why it's considered appropriate that provision regarding the handling of complaints is dealt with in directions rather than set out on the face of the Bill? Two, can it give examples of the sort of cases under which it is envisaged the Parliament might direct the Commissioner not to carry out an assessment of a complaint or an investigation into a complaint? Three, in relation to Section 24.5a, in what sorts of cases where a complaint is inadmissible by virtue of the rules in Section 23.3, it is envisaged that the Scottish Parliament would direct the Commissioner to report why it's considered appropriate to specify those classes of case in directions rather than the faces of the Bill, and for what further procedural provision for directions under the Bill, including as regards publication, is envisaged to be required by the Parliament's standing orders, why it's considered appropriate these matters are subject to provision made in standing orders rather than set out on the face of the Bill. Section 44.1 provides that the Parliament must publish a code of conduct for persons lobbying members of Parliament. Does the Committee agree to ask the Scottish Government for an explanation as to A, why it is being considered appropriate the section does not include requirements for persons to comply with the code or have regard to the code, and B, why it, it, it has been considered appropriate the section does not contain any sanction or enforcement provision in relation to a breach of the code? Yes. Okay. That completes the public section of the meeting, and I move into private. Thank you.